initial is a confusing word in this context. But it's a sensitivity to conditions a long time ago. The weather is probably the same way, so let me describe it in terms of the weather. Uh, it is believed that if you change something now, if, for example, some professorial type blows a puff of hot air now, that that will affect the uh, weather in a way analogous to this. There's nothing much is going to change in the weather tomorrow or the next day or the day after. But any change, no matter how tiny, can affect the weather if we go far enough into the future. So this uh, extra puff of hot air might produce fog, for example, in Soldier Field, a place where we'll go <laughs> A fog in a, 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 in a meeting place of intellectuals. <laughs> uh, and uh, then uh, this, uh, but not soon, if you have to wait long enough. But if you wait long enough, any small event can have far enough into the future a very large impact. That is sensitivity to initial conditions and it's connected with the difficulty of predictions that I uh, told you about. But I'm a physicist <coughs> part of mathematical physics. And what I'm going to try to do in the next three slides ask you to try to follow the mathematics. Uh, many of you will do it very easily. Uh, some of you will do it with a little difficulty. But try to follow it. doesn't depend on anything more again than high school mathematics. I'm going to try to show you precisely why it is that that R equals 4 solution is sensitively dependent on initial conditions and is chaotic. Now, the first thing I have to remind you of is your high school trip. But uh, as you recall, if you write a triangle like this, <coughs> with the hypotenuse of length 1 and the near side of length x, and there's an angle theta there, you define the cosine of theta as x over 1, x divided by 1, or cosine theta equals x. Furthermore, because when you go through 360 degrees, Nothing can change. 360 degrees is a complete revolution. The cosine of, of the angle, theta, is defined so the cosine theta plus 360 degrees is the same as cosine theta. Now, I'm going to only do one thing that's different from what you learned in high school. I'm going to use my rights to change the unit of angle. Now, uh, uh, physicists like mathematicians like to use radians. In high school, we learned degrees. I can't understand how anybody could have invented something like degrees. I've never, it must have been a millipede or somebody. <laughs> <laughs> well, in any case, I don't know why anybody used degrees. But I'm going to use, I'm going to normalize my angles so that my angle is such that when you go around once, the angle changes by one. So instead of writing cosine theta as the same as cosine theta plus 360, I will write cosine theta plus 1 is cosine theta. And now I need one more fact, a trigonometric identity relating cosine 2 theta to cosine squared theta. So we put this aside, we remember all that stuff, and now we look at the model. The model at this place that is very chaotic, at r equals 4, is xt plus 1 is 4 times xt times 1 minus x. The solution I'm about to give you is due to some very famous person, I think, certainly not mine, but maybe Fermi and maybe Ulam's solution. But one of these very famous guys set out to solve the problem. And there's no systematic way of solving a hard problem. The best way of solving a hard problem is you make a clever guess. And these guys did, one of these guys did exactly that. They said, let's instead of using the variable x, use the variable theta. Right, xt is 1 minus cosine theta t over 2. xt plus 1 is 1 minus cosine theta t plus 1 over 2. So they're going to think about the problems in terms of the variable defined as theta instead of the variable defined as x. And I take this and I substitute here. I take this and substitute there and there. As I substitute on the left-hand side, I get 1 minus cosine theta t one divided by two. As I substitute on the right hand side, I get four. X becomes one minus cosine theta over two. And one minus X becomes one plus cosine theta over two. 
using that trig identity that I showed you. Now I've got an exact solution. Because here I have theta at time t plus 1. Here I have 2 times th theta at time t. I would have an exact solution if I wrote down that theta at time t plus 1 is twice theta at time t. Or I could write theta at time t is equal to 2 raised to the power t times theta at time 0. That's the solution, all right. Now I want to tell you a little bit more about the solution. Theta t has the same meaning as theta t minus 1 or theta t minus 2 or theta t minus 3 because the cosine doesn't change if we subtract 1 or 2 or 3 from the cosine. And x is the only thing that's really meaningful. Okay? Now I have the solution. I can interpret it using this. But I need one more thing that we all learned in high school, except for me, because I'm too old. That is base 2. Recall that if we want to write a number which is 1 times 2 to the 3 third power plus 0 times 2 to the fourth power plus 0 times 2 to the first power plus 1 times 2 to the 0 power, dot, 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 dot. That is, you want to express things in terms of powers of 2. You do that by writing the number base 2. For this 8, which is 2 to the 3, you put a 1 in the position here. For this 4, which is 2 to the square power, you put a 0 in that position. If uh, For this 2 to the first power, which has a 0 multiplied, you put a 0 there, a 1 there. And this is the base 2 representation of this number. Now, I'm using base 2 because I can multiply real easy base 2. Just like multiplying by 10, base 10 is just shifting the decimal point by one unit. Multiplying by 2, base 2, is shifting this binary point over one step. So, let's talk about the solution for a moment. Here's the solution written down again. Theta in the next year, which determines x in the next year, is twice the theta in this year. I've said all this before. Now I want you to imagine that I started out with some population which could be represented by putting this value of theta inside the cosine and looking up cosine inside my table to get x in the first year. Theta zero is that. Now how do I get to the next year? To get to the next year, I multiply by two. So theta 1 multiplied by 2 as I shift this point one unit to the right, I get that. But when I get that, I notice that theta t minus 1 is the same thing as theta t, so I'm going to throw away the 1. Same thing, meaning it produces the same x value, so it doesn't make any difference if I write theta or theta minus 1. So instead of writing it this way, I'm going to write it that way. In the Next year, I shift over by, oh boy, did I make a mistake? Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. In the next year, I shift over by one decimal point, and I find that is the answer in year two. In the year of, year four dollars. One second to do the calculation. That's the, that's the answer in year three, and so forth. In year three, we have one of these ones hanging out. And I drop it because of that one. Now, notice what's going on here. I started out with a number that had three, six, seven digits in it. After a year two, I only had five digits. By year seven, I only have one digit. After eight steps, after eight years, I've lost all information about my starting point. That is all the information about what will happen in years far in the future are contained in these high order binary 
precision, I wouldn't know any of these pilot numbers, and I would have no information about what would happen after the eighth year. <coughs> this example shows you that at least in this one chaotic system, all the information is contained in kind of the details of the starting point. Here, uh, here are the rule, here's the, the conceptual information I want you to get out. First of all, I want you to get out the idea that by using an exact solution, we can gain a lot of information about the system. Secondly, we can, I want you to get the idea that we can see complex patterns in the X versus T plot, even from very simple rules. For example, that rule. Why? Simple laws applied again and again and again can lead to complex outcomes. Let me make that, uh, let me try to make that explicit. The reason that the objects of biology are complicated is, in my opinion, not because the laws that govern them are complicated, <coughs> but because these laws are applied to many molecules and applied again and again and again. And the successive, the successive application of simple laws producing the growth process leads to the complex outcome. Part of that is the tiny details of the initial situation can produce a change in outcome at the end of a long period. For example, one extra puff of hot air can lead in a decade or a century to a fog that wouldn't have existed otherwise. So even if the situation is predictable in the short run, we can't always expect accurate long run predictions to be possible. It is, however, true that in these systems, Long-term predictions can be made on a probabilistic basis. That is, for example, I could tell you in this R equals 4 system that all values in the long run, all values of theta between 0 and 1 were equally possible. And then with a little bit of calculus, one, you can, one could convert that into a statement about what the probabilities of various values of x. Well, the main conceptual part of my story Told, I have a little bit more to tell you, and I'm about to do that. But I'm going to do it rather quickly. What I'm going to try to tell you about is how one goes from here at r equals 3, where there was only one possible x value that ever appeared in the long run here at r equals 4, in which, as you saw, all x values were represented, and you had a very chaotic situation. How does one get from there to there? I'm going to show you some pictures and tell you how, how it occurs, and I am going to do that in the next nine minutes. You've already seen this picture. This is the order which arises at r equals 2. Doesn't depend on your starting point if you come and you settle down at a fixed insect population. Oh, I'd better remind you what these pictures mean. Uh, here is the x value we're plotting as a function of time. Time is called j here. This is the here you start with the next year, the next year, the next year. And the long run outcome is shown on this bar on the right. Now, the, a funny thing happens as we increase the growth rate. That funny thing is that, let's look at, I don't know if I want to look at it from my point of view, I don't like mosquitoes much, or from the mosquitoes' point of view. Let me look at it from the mosquitoes' point of view. I'll be good uh, on uh, These years, there are relatively few mosquitoes, and they breed avidly. The, near, the following year, there are too many mosquitoes. Life is crowded and ugly. It's hard to raise a family. So that on the next year, there are a few mosquitoes. Next year, lots, few, lots. Up and down, up and down. The pattern then for this higher value of the growth rate is <coughs> that the population oscillates between a low value and a high value. If we increase the population, somewhat. If we increase the growth rate somewhat more, the oscillation becomes more complicated. 
3.48 during a cycle of about four years. You start out with a low value of the population, it gets high, then it's low, it's not as low as this, then it gets highest, it goes down to the lowest value again, and that repeats. There are four values in the population. Let me show you these values for population on this picture. So, for a while in R, for a while in R, you get two possible values. And then for a while after that, you get four possible values. And then they won't be surprised by saying you raise R still further. You've got eight possible values, 16, 32, 64, until step by step, this doubling fashion chaos is produced. Here is the part of the picture from here out. I can't draw it on the blackboard very well, so instead of drawing it on the blackboard, I have borrowed a version of it produced by my friend, Bernardo Huberman. Uh, we get this. At R equals 3, there's what's called the bifurcation. Population has two possible values, high in one year, low in that. Then to four, then to eight, then to sixteen, which you can just see on this picture. And then after that, you get thirty-two and sixty-four. I better use a different kind of picture to show you all that, because it's hard to see here. And I will use a slightly different kind of picture. This is a logarithmic scale. I have expanded the region in which there are this is a logarithmic scale. I've expanded the region in which there are uh, high order, long period cycles, and contracted the region in which there's a low order behavior. Or one, zero to one takes up the same space as one to three, takes the same space as three to three point four four nine five. What happens is you get a period doubling, and then another doubling, and then another, and then another, and then another, until at some special value of R called the Feigen bound point, you reach a cycle which has infinite length. This is the first tiny bit of chaos in the system. Now, so far the whole story I have told you is a theoretical one. But there's an experimental story to be told too. My colleague Albert Lipschebeck took a pot filled with first liquid helium and then liquid mercury, heated it from below, and measured the temperature at a point in the thing. As the heating rate got large, he observed that the pattern of temperature started to oscillate at the point it was measured. A sort of oscillatory pattern of temperature, one like this, perhaps. And what he did, conceptually, this is a slight lie, what he did was we measured the temperature at each peak in this oscillatory pattern and plotted the peak temperatures as a function of peak number. He did that first at low heating rates, and then he started to push the heating rate up further. As he worked at low heating rates, the temperature settled down to a zero value, Higher heat rates went to a constant value. Then he saw a period doubling, and another period doubling, and another period doubling, until he saw the chaos arose in the system from a very large number of period doublings. The last question that was asked, or one of the questions that was asked, was, is it true that in the experimental system, the period doubling is like the period doubling we observe in this simplified insect model. <coughs> now, here is where I am going to uh, take a long story and make it up essentially zero left. <coughs> what we wanted to know was whether this period doubling phenomenon was a lot like the one that had been observed in the last. And what we did was, we now did a large group of people from the University 
structure within structure. We then analyzed this fractal as it arose in the experimental system and as it arose in the theoretical system. And in the analysis, oh, I want to convince you that this is a fractal, so I will do that. I will try to convince you that this object, which is the set of all x values that arises after infinite period doubling, is a fractal set. The first thing I'm going to do is rewrite the set on this transparency. As you can see, it's exactly the same set, so I'm going to pull off the old transparency to keep you the new one. Fractal is defined, as you recall, by having a structures within structures, namely, Within this fractal, there's supposed to be small copies of the same object. Okay? Show you that there's indeed a small copy of this object within it. I take this piece of it, put the arrow to show you what I'm doing, and blow it up and turn it over. Here is this piece. Blow it up and turn it over. So that <coughs> is that. This thing over here is these two guys over after it got blown up, you can see more structure. This one over here corresponds to these two guys <coughs> and so forth. You can see that this thing fundamentally has the same structure as that. Therefore, the object that arose at the beginning of chaos was indeed a fractal. And now, if I had an audience of technical people here, I would explain all of the lovely tricks that we used to analyze this fractal and show that the fractal that arose in the experiment was really the same kind of object as the fractal that arose in the uh, model system. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to just tell you the answer. Yes, they are the same. And because we understand pretty well the period doubling onset of chaos in the model system, and because the two, because that's the same as the experimental system, then we can feel that we understand the uh, onset of chaos in the experimental system. We can feel that we understand quite reasonably well what happens at the beginning of chaos in many, many different systems in the world. The major accomplishments here, I should emphasize, are due to Lee Chabag, Feigenbaum, who did most of the theory, but I talk too much about the theory, and then the last piece is a group of people from the University of Chicago getting things together. So, what do we understand? We certainly understand the onset of chaos that occurs right there when we get an infinite period. We understand quite well the well-developed chaos that occurs right there when you have the system at R equals 4. For this model system, we understand what goes on in the middle. However, if you give me a real pot of water and ask me to explain to you in detail what the chaos that the turbulence that I observe in that real pot of boiling water, I will tell you, well, I have a good idea of how it might be starts to be chaotic. I have a good idea of how some systems might be chaotic, but that particular chaos arising in that particular real system, unfortunately, science has not gone far enough to understand that yet. So of course, I'm thrilled that we don't understand it, because it gives me lots of fun things to study in the future, and maybe give many of you fun things that you will want to learn about and study about in the future. 